uh, just because we're getting close here, um, do you want to say a little bit about immolations? Because I think that so few people are aware of the U.S. role in that after, um, you know, in, in, especially in the 1960s after Kwong Book and Saigon. And then you have, you know, so I think a few people have heard of Norman Morrison. But do you want to talk a little bit about about that? Because it's really fascinating. Sure. More yeah, so, I mean, so one of the, you know, current project that I'm working on, as Scott mentioned at the beginning of this, was um, this project on self-immolation um, and particularly as a, a tactic of protest. Um, you know, the iconic, uh, if anyone here is a uh, Rage Against the Machine fan, you know, that you've yeah. probably seen the, their first album cover, um, you know, is the self, is a black and white print of the self-immolation of Duk in Saigon in 1963, um, which is, you know, that's a Pulitzer Prize winning photo by Malcolm Brown. Um, and, you know, two years later in 1965, starting in the spring with Alice Hirsch, and then, you know, after the summer, uh, at the end of, well, yeah, at the beginning of November with Norman Morrison, um, you start to see, you know, a cycle of essentially like imitations of Tik Kwong Duk. Now there's, there's different frameworks of thinking about this because, you know, self-immolation as a devotional practice in, in certain types of Buddhism, like pre-existed um, Kwong Duk self-immolation. So there's like a, a, a kind of a, a, the, a theological Buddhist framework for understanding that particular act. Um, but with the self-immolation of Roger Laporte, which happened one week after Norman Morrison, kind of famously, Norman Morrison is probably the most famous self-immolator in the United States. Um, and, you know, he self-immolated outside of the Pentagon in eyesight of Roger McNamara. And Ro McNamara Robert. Cred credits this with eventually like, or Robert, sorry, um, credits this with uh, transforming his kind of view of, of the war, which might be a little bit too too simplistic of a, a reading on his part. It's um, Mac Have you ever heard the story, I'm sorry for interrupting, about McNamara and Morrison's, I guess his widow or his family. When McNamara finally wrote that book, mm -hmm. uh, I guess the Morrison's made, or he made an overture to Morrison and they had some kind of public meeting. And then he used that and his, you know, kind of PR for distribu distributing the book. And the Morrison's were just furious and ambitious. I mean, that's not surprising. <laughs> no, McNamara is really low, but... Yeah, the Morrisons thought he was reaching out like earnestly and sincerely. Yeah. He wanted, you know, promo material. I mean, that sounds just like something he would do. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sorry for interrupting, Very but I always personal. tell people that story. Yeah. But so, I mean, the thing with Roger Laporte's self immolation um, is interesting because, you know, this is so in August of 1965 is when the, you know, the, the government passes the, the law that makes draft card burning illegal. Right. Um, and, you know, earlier that week, so, so Norman Moore, so earl earlier that week, right, there's a draft card burning uh, kind of rally in Union Square that uh, there is, you know, Dorothy Day spoke at it. Um, you know, AJ Must spoke at it. There was a series of, there are five men, including a, a Catholic worker named Tom Cornell, who's like a, an august figure within Catholic worker history. He's on that interview with Dorothy Day. Yeah. Yeah. Um, he was one of the people who attempts to, to light their draft card on fire on stage um, and counter protesters had brought a fire extinguisher and, and hose them down. So if you, if you look for pictures on it, you can see them just like covered in um, fire extinguisher spray. Um, Norman, or Roger Laporte is at this and Roger Laporte, you know, he's someone who grew up in, in Western New York or North, upstate New York, way upstate uh, Geneva. Um, he'd been living in the Catholic worker. He was, he was in his early twenties um, and had been, uh, you know, kind of like the, the real like blue collar level of Catholic workers. So the younger people who are doing a lot of the day to day maintenance of the house. Um, and, you know, I've talked to some of his friends and um, they really like didn't seem to be any indication that he was going to self immolate. Um, there's some, you know, I think retroactively like people recalling his demeanor during this period of time as being like incredibly intense. But, um, you know, when he finds himself, um, you know, before sunrise standing across the street from the United Nations building, you know, in the like Midtown East, um, you know, none of his friends have an, any inkling that this is going to happen. Um, and so, you know, he's found by a security guard and as he's eventually wheeled into, um, you know, as he's, as he's wheeled into the ambulance, he says, you know, I'm Roger Laporte. I did this as a religious act. I'm a Catholic worker. Um, and, you know, he dies the next day from, you know, from burns, you know, around his body. Um, you know, this leads to this kind of like epic 
part of Dan Berrigan's history. Dan Berrigan, you know, was already a, a Jesuit priest at this time. Um, you know, had been teaching at Lemoyne College uh, in Syracuse, but eventually he took a job in New York City to work for a journal called Jesuit Missions, which was the Jesuit priest's kind of missionary uh, newspaper. And he had, he had already made contact with some members of the Catholic worker prior to moving to New York City, but becomes like increasingly um, incorporated into that world during this period in time. And in the days following Laporte's death, and this is, this is where things get a little bit kind of, you know, it's, there's a lot of like a few conflicting narratives, but um, after Roger Laporte's death, the Catholic worker goes completely silent um, while they attempt to kind of put together an explanation or a, a kind of a response. Um, obviously, like everyone is like deeply kind of traumatized by this event. Um, and within a couple of days after Laporte's death, Berrigan gives a homily, a requiem mass in the Catholic worker house in downtown Manhattan. Word gets around that this has happened and there's a text of the speech that in which Berrigan likens Roger Laporte's acts to Jesus's crucifixion. And, you know, recalls that, you know, sort of like, you know, laying one's life down for others, right? Um, and this eventually makes its way back to Spellman, who's in Rome at the time, because this is during the Second Vatican Council. Um, and as the narrative goes, initially, um, Spellman has him essentially like kicked out of New York. <laughs> um, now, Roger Van Allen, who is an emeritus professor at Villanova, has done some like very good historical research. And it actually seems more like Dan Berrigan's superior in the Jesuits at, that, at his job sends him to Latin America to get him out of town before Spellman hears about this. But nevertheless, the, the narrative is that Spellman kicks Berrigan out. And so there becomes this like enormous uproar around this um, for people who would kind of, and, and this is the beginning of Berrigan's kind of cult of personality, right? And so you see there's over a thousand people sign a letter which is published in the New York Times in support of Dan Berrigan, vilifying um, Cardinal Spellman. There's a hunger strike at Notre Dame uh, to bring Berrigan back. Um, and this whole time he's actually in Mexico and then he's, he eventually makes his way farther south. Um, and he's basically completely cut off from the US context. And he has some letters to his brother where he, you know, he, he's going through like a, like a, a little bit of a depression, um, but then he gets incorporated into the world and gets exposed to the world of, of liberation theology in Latin America, um, which, you know, makes him more militant than he had been previously. Um, and so he comes back almost as this kind of like fully formed, I mean, maybe now I'm dramatizing it, but as this like fully formed um, kind of like radical priest who also has a base of popular support, right? Because of this whole, the, the festering of this narrative of him being excommunicated, which is being presented by a lot of people on the left, at least the Catholic kind of left as a quasi martyrdom. So there's a way in which actually Berrigan's narrative completely supersedes the story of Roger Laporte um, in a way that is, cur is interesting and curious and you know, uh, complicated. Um, but the, 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 the self-immolation of Roger Laporte actually is conscripted into the, the developmental kind of like superhero origin story of, of Dan Berrigan. Um, and I think one of the things about Roger Laporte, which is I think interesting and maybe in terms of like self-immolation as a, a, a device or a tactic is interesting is the way in which you see there being um, kind of transnational and, and kind of trans-religious ways of, of kind of turning this into a form of mysticism, right? So Kwang Duk, right, is famously has his heart remain intact after his self-immolation. Um, after he is, his remains are cremated again, right, for in, in, a, in a funeral ceremony and his heart continues to remain intact and you can, you can see it still, right, at his home monastery. Um, Roger Laporte and Norman Morrison, um, they both have streets named after them, right, in, in Vietnam. Um, and they're seen as being, you know, kind of martyrs of a kind, right, on behalf of the Vietnamese people. Um, and this notion of martyrdom through self-immolation, both in Buddhism and Christianity, although Buddhism doesn't have the same archetype of um, martyrdom as Christianity does, right, because of Christianity's emphasis on the crucifixion. 
um, as being like paradigmatic story of the tradition, um, raises interesting questions in my mind about the relationship between um, suicide and martyrdom. And, you know, with, with Kuang Duk, right, the, the kind of famous apologist of Kuang Duk's self-immolation was Thich Nhat Hanh, um, who is now kind of well known as, you know, a meditation leader. Um, but he, you know, he has a letter to Martin Luther King very soon after Kuang Duk's self-immolation, um, where he explains that Kuang Duk's self-immolation wasn't suicide at all, right? Um, and he makes a distinction between the death of the body and the death of the soul, but also, um, you know, suicide as kind of moral violence in distinction to the martyrdom that he's kind of attributing to Kuang Duk. People do kind of, there's a similar debate happens in Roman Catholicism because of course in Catholicism, um, suicide is one of the only unforgivable sins, right? And that was how I was taught as a kid, right? That is like a scare tactic to prevent you from committing suicide, right? It's like, you can't repent from suicide, ergo, it's the only thing that's guaranteed to send you to hell. Um, whereas, you know, Berrigan's interpretation and, and some people who are, who are more quiet about it, I think, um, started to look at uh, Roger Laporte's self-immolation as a mystical act um, that was, you know, in some way akin to the crucifixion, like, and uh, allowed for a kind of absorption into the divine through the act of death. And this is, this is a, a framework that's actually very kind of early Christian, right? If you look at the, the, the era of the early Christian martyrs, someone like Ignatius of Antioch, you know, who is, is captured um, and is, you know, allegedly, I think, under charges of sedition from the Roman Empire and marched from Turkey all the way to Rome, where eventually he's devoured by lions in the Colosseum. He smuggles letters back to his congregation that says, like, I can't wait to have my limbs ripped apart from me. I hope nobody comes to rescue me um, because through this you know, kind of pain and suffering and ultimately death, I will be united with, with God. And so again, right, with, with Roger Laporte's self-immolation, you see this like very mystical way of thinking about an act of protest um, that is part of a worldview that's like completely beyond what it appears to be on the, the kind of surface level. Now, we don't know if Roger Laporte actually believed all of that himself, right? Because we don't have his own like writings, you know? Um, but in terms of how he's operated as a figure, um, and in a sense, like how Dorothy Day also operates as a figure, um, you know, once they've passed, they're no longer really like their own subjects, right? That they're, they're subjects to the interpretation of people who admire them. And in the case of Dorothy Day in particular, re like revere her as, as a saint, you know? Yeah. You see similar narratives about people like Nat Turner and John Brown. Yeah. In the, in and the, John in Brown, the, for sure. Yeah, I mean, of course, the gallows see, as holy as the cross. Yeah. Yeah. And of course, I mean, John Brown, there's, you know, famously like drawn basically like as Moses, you know, in yeah, this one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, sure. Um, yeah, I mean, Laporte doesn't have that much of a following, but there are, you know, it is kind of like whispered a little bit. Yeah. You know, I've talked to a lot of Vietnam vets, especially the VVAW types, and it's amazing how often um, Morrison, Laporte's especially name comes up, Alice Hurst especially also, but um, it's just crazy. Like these Viet vets, like many of them talked about Norman Morrison. That's where I saw the pictures of Norman Morrison and Roger Laporte streets and things like that. So, I mean, it was bigger than I would have imagined, you know, because apparently like a lot of these guys in Vietnam, you know, in uniform are talking about it. So, yeah. It's, and I think, you know, with the, with Vietnam, you know, especially the, the imagery of Quang Duc's immolation. And I think this, this might again, like ping pong off of, the American self-immolations, and, and Quang Duc wasn't the only Vietnamese person to self-immolate. No, he was the most no, famous, there, right? there were a lot, yeah. Um, but it's, you know, it's the, this is the era of napalm, right? Um, and the, the imagery specifically of like fire, right? Like auto cremation is how some people talk about it. Um, it I think is has to be particularly powerful during that period of time. Oh, I think so. Well, um, but continues, I mean, but not for nothing continues to be. I mean, self-immolation is still a thing. If I have a Google alert about self-immolation, oh. <laughs> but you know that it ha it's, I mean, it's still ongoing, you know, since 2009, there've been over 150 documented cases of self-immolation inside Tibet or, you know, in Tibetan communities. Um, and, and Tibetan communities actually are also 
reading those self-immolations back into relationship to Tikhuang Duck. Um, okay. And so Which, there is this way, right? And I mean, and, you know, and, and during Arab you know, Spring, during the Cold War, there's also like famous self-immolations. I mean, self-immolate, you know, yeah, Arab Spring, yeah, um, Mohammed Bouazizi, right? There's, yeah. there's a lot of ways in which self-immolation continues to be, you know, it exerts a certain kind of like, um, I think power by force of its sheer kind of horror, in addition to what other like conceptual framework you might attribute to it. Um, it's, it's like, it's unimaginable in a particular type of way that other, other forms of, of death aren't, you know, because, um, you know, we, we all have, it's the idea, it, because it's so prolonged, right? And it seems so violent in its actual like form. Um, and of course the, the, the video of it, you know, in some cases with, with Tibetans, right, we have smuggled SIM card footage, which is usually like very poor quality um, or, or still photos, but um, the, there's a kind of brutality to it that um, I think it, it disturbs and attracts simultaneously um, in terms of the force of the act that's, that's distingu that distinguishes it from say something like, you know, if you were just to like OD on pills for a, for a cause, right? And there's a kind of liturgical aspect to it um, or almost like a ritualistic aspect to it, especially with Kwang Duck, right? Because he maintains like perfect meditative poise um, that kind of brings a, an eerie sense of power into, into the act itself. 